Let me invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians. I was there last week. I want to be back in here again this week. And it's one of the most encouraging books in all of the scripture. It's the first church that Paul planted on the European continent. But also, it was a church like every other church that sometimes finds itself in a challenging situation in terms of unity. Uh, they, different people think different things. They start to getting, um, I, I liken it to golf. I was told that if I was ever going to play golf, that before I ever even picked up a club, that I should go hire a professional to give me a lesson so that I would learn how to do it right before I got bad habits locked into me. Do you think I listen to that? Of course not. Do you know who you're talking to? I know how to play golf. Now, I play golf like I play base, I swing a golf club like I would swing a baseball bat, which is typical, and you can't do that. Do you know how hard it is to get out of you a bad habit that was put into you? That's hard. I still swing a golf club like a baseball bat. And, and so, so I'm not a good golfer because I refuse to learn how to play the game right. So I'll never make a living at it. I play once a year. And I'm about 110 golfer on the first nine. <laughs> it costs me $50 in golf balls to play the first nine. Because if there's water, it's going in. <laughs> Might as well just walk on the other side and drop a ball, take the strokes. Because it's going in. In Christianity sometimes, we learn bad habits. And it's hard for us to get back in the right thing. And if we go long enough one direction and we don't turn around, well, it really messes us up. So Paul comes to this church that's an encouraging church to him, and he shares a very, very eternal passage, an eternal thing, a non-worldly teaching. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, this is one of the very famous, well-known passages, but it is not worldly. This is a heavenly passage. This is a, this is a, a thought and a situation that happened in heaven with God and with Jesus before he ever came to earth. And it's a big deal. So read it. I should go to verse 11, but I don't have time. So I just want to go to verse 8. Listen to what it says. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Father, we thank you for this hour and thank you for the opportunity that we have to share. It's encouraging when I walk in from greeting our guests to be able to walk into this place and see worship. See folks who are truly engaged in who you are and honoring you. Thank you for that. I pray that our worship will continue to expand and grow until anybody who walks in here would realize that when we say that we love you, we're, it's not lip service. It's real. So, Father, if we have been concerned because we sense that you're not dealing with us, help us today to realize maybe it could be that we're not dealing with you anymore. And help us to change that. I'm sure that you can. If there are those who are lost and undone without you, on their way to hell, but in need of being on their way to heaven, I trust that today we will give them Jesus. Or we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Give me Jesus. You know, I told you last week that I want this year to be the best year that you have ever had. The best year that we as a church body have ever had. In order to do that, I told you, and I gave you a latter illustration that you need to forget those things which are behind, reach forward to those things that are right there in front of you, and always keep your eye fixed on the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I think that is so important. And, and if we're going to be able to do that, if we're really going to be able to do that, then we have to keep in mind that our future is fixed, good or bad, it is fixed in the person of Jesus Christ. Lost or saved, our life where our life ends up is, is in the hand of Jesus. And so we want to have people that don't know Christ coming in here because their life, their destiny, their eternity is fixed in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And even with that said, so many people choose not to engage and involve themselves in the family of God. Why is that? Well, I've done my own study and my own sort of unofficial sort of surveying. And I've asked some people why they don't like church, why they don't come to church, what, what is going on. And you know what I've discovered is for most of the time, almost 100% of the time, nobody really has an issue with Jesus. They seem to be okay with Jesus. In fact, they seem to know a lot more about Jesus than we know. If you were to ask a typical person who's not a church goer and hasn't made a decision for Jesus, and you were to ask them about something about God, they would generally come up with a response that is basically someone has said something to them about something they're doing, and they feel rather condemned. And here's what their response might be. If God is such a loving God, why? Why do they say that? They say that because they have a sense to know that God is a loving God. Unfortunately, we as a church body, we don't always seem to know that. We tend to focus on the wrathful side of God. And it could be that what's happened to us is when we first came in and we first met Jesus and he was dealing with us, his dealings with us were as a sinner, but what he was pouring on us was grace, mercy, peace, comfort, encouragement. And then after we were forgiven from our sin, we got concerned about those people that were out there in the world, rightfully so. And as we got concerned, though, we got more focused on what they were doing wrong than what we ourselves had been forgiven from. And as a result of getting focused on what people were doing wrong out there, our, our message sort of shifted, and it shifted from that grace and that mercy, and it shifted to judgment. And once you start getting a mouth of judgment and a heart of judgment and a life of judgment, it tends to really kind of chill out the faith that you had when you first started. It tends to cool off that heart because, see, when I walk in front of somebody, I'm like, good night, what a sinner, they're going to hell. I don't really approach people that way. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what a Savior who can forgive them of everything they've ever done. That's a different way to approach life. Well, Pastor, do you know that this is going on in the world? Yeah, but I'm sure thankful that Jesus can handle that. I'm sure thankful that Jesus can overcome that and has. I'm sure thankful that Jesus is the answer to that. And that's a challenge for some of us. In the church world, there's a lot of competition. You know what I mean? There's a lot of competition. And sometimes whenever you get a, I don't know if you ever get these, but sometimes I get these moments of awareness, these moments where I, I realize something I didn't know before that I really didn't know. And whenever I get those, it's pretty amazing. Uh, sometimes uh, maybe I'll go and I'll put a pair of slacks on and Terry didn't check my pockets when she washed them. And I haven't worn them in three or four months. And I go in there and I'm like, what is that? I pull out a $20 bill. Do you know what kind of a realization that is? That's like free money. Even though it wasn't free when you earned it. Not, but when you find it, that's free. And you start thinking, what can I spend? What can I buy? What can I do? Because it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. I didn't, I didn't, that's not earmarked for anything. And then you can go out and spend it. You know what I'm talking about? It's that kind of realization. It's pretty awesome. And I had a realization recently especially in the church realm, was uh, I, I've been accused of some things, and I appreciate the accusation because it causes me to think. But I've been accused. You, you, you want to be that multi-site church. And it, it hit me the other day. We are a multi-site church. We are. What is the multi-site? Well, see, when I realize in Scripture, the Bible talks about us being one church, that means that today, on Sunday, however the sun moves, my church, because there's only one, meets all over the world. It's a multi-site church. meets everywhere. It's a multi-led church. It's got a lot of pastors, a lot of deacons, a lot of serving people. It's a multicultural church. Y'all aren't very multicultural. What are you talking about? There's only one church, and it's filled with all the nations. We're an extremely multicultural church. But where does it meet? 
Well, one of them meets right here at 2501 North College Road. One meets across the street at Fellowship. One meets down the road at Castle Hain. One meets at Port City. And one of them meets at Scotts Hill. And one of them meets at Calvary. And one of them meets at Longleaf. And some of them meet at the uh, United Methodist Church. And some meet at the Catholic Church. And some meet all. Because we're just a multi-site church if we're part of the body of Christ. I'm deeply encouraged by that. Because that means there's no competition. Well, does that mean you agree with everybody? <laughs> no. It doesn't. But you know what? God doesn't have me there to, to influence them. He has me here to influence you. So I'm going to focus on you. Okay? All right? So hopefully you can handle some of that. Here's what I've learned. I don't need to give people my culture. And I certainly don't need to give them my church. And I don't need to give them my traditions. And I don't need to give them my understanding. I need to give them Jesus. When I came, it was Jesus who saved me. It was Jesus who changed me. It is Jesus who continues to transform me. It is Jesus to whom I will give an account. It is Jesus who is coming to get me. It is Jesus that keeps me happy. Therefore, instead of in 2014 us ever trying to give anybody anything that we have here, let's give them Jesus because that's who they need. And guess what? That's who you need, isn't it? Don't, don't you want to meet Jesus? I tell you what, if I was walking down the road, walking down the aisle in Walmart, I'd rather meet Jesus than some of y'all. Because <laughs> sometimes y'all come and you, you chew me up and spit me out. But Jesus loves me. So, you know how I know? The Bible tells me so. That's right. The Bible tells me so. So I want to give Jesus. How are we going to do that? How would you do that? Let me give you three ways, because I'm still a good Baptist preacher. So I still have three points in a poem. So I, I want to I take this passage of Scripture in Philippians 2, and I want to preach it backwards, if you'll allow me. Which means that I want to start at verse 5 and go to 6 and then 7 and 8. I want to start at verse 8 and go to 7, 6, and 5. Because I think it lends itself to that kind of a thing. And remember, I told you this passage is otherworldly. Which means it is a passage that if coupled with Hebrews chapter 10, where the Bible tells us about this conversation that the Father and Jesus had before Jesus stepped into the body that God had prepared for him in Bethlehem, that there was this conversation that went on, and this was the attitude that Jesus had before he came. In other words, when we get ready to enter into ministry, enter into whatever it is that God's called us to do, we ought to know what we're going to do before we get, go out to do it. Don't you think? Doesn't that help a whole lot more to know what you're planning on doing and what it's going to take to do it before you ever start? That way you don't have so many detours out there on the journey. So let me give you three things. If we're really going to have a great year, and we're going to make sure that when folks walk in here that we give them Jesus. They don't need Northside, and they don't need Pastor Kenny. They need Jesus. So let's make sure we give them. How do we do that? Number one, we will have to accept reality. We've got to accept reality. In verse 8, the Bible says there that Jesus being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, I'm going to give you a brief summary, and then I'm going to jump into this. Before Jesus ever left heaven, he already knew what it was going to take to help us before he left. And his whole life existence was in pursuit of that thing that would help us. In order for Jesus to say, I'm going down there to die, Hebrews chapter 10 says this, Jesus basically said to the Father, sacrifice and offering you do not desire. But a body you have prepared for me, and I have come to do your will, O Lord. Jesus came to make a sacrifice. Jesus came to make an offering. Jesus came to die. Why? Why did he come to die? Let me give you some reasons why. And if we could grab a hold of this, if we could grasp this reality, I think we could have a much more effective ministry and see so many more people saved and so many more people helped. First of all, if we're going to grasp, truly grasp reality, we need to understand that people can't be repaired. If people could be repaired, Jesus would not have come to the cross he would have come and set up a repair shop. He would have come and given us a 12-step program. 
he would have come and made sure that, you know, with, with a, a, a tool bag with screwdrivers and hammers and saws and tape and duct tape and stuff like that. And he would have just fixed the particular area of your life that was broken. He would have done that. But he understood from the very beginning that people can't be fixed. They have to be redeemed. They can't be fixed. You know what religion's all about? Trying to fix you. You kind of, well, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm really struggling. If you come see Pastor Kenny and you come talk to him, he'll counsel you through something and you'll be fixed. No, you won't. You'll be as broken or if not worse than whenever you first came in. I can't fix you. I can't even help you. I can encourage you, pray for you, support you, and all those kind of things, but I can't fix you. And God knew that he could not fix us. The verses that we just throw out there because we think that they're so good, but we pay no attention to them. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. None. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says that they looked through to heaven and earth looking for someone worthy to open the scrolls that were in heaven, and they all felt bad because even at that point in history, nobody was worthy. Why? None of us were fixed, and none of us could be fixed. Nobody can be fixed. Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which lets us know we're all broken and we're irreparably broken. Can you imagine, have you ever seen these windows that they have that are like tempered glass? They're really hard to break, but if you ever break one, it explodes into a million pieces. And now if we broke a glass, could you see me if you come by during the week and I've got all these millions of pieces of glass on a table with some glue in my hand? And I'm trying to put that back. What would you say? What are you doing? Well, I figure if I can glue this back together, it'll look like it started out. No, no, no. You can't put broken glass back together. And we're like broken glass. Can't be fixed. That's why Jesus came to the cross, because you can't be fixed. Guys, we can't fix anybody. This church can't fix anybody. And until we understand that, we won't stop pursuing a methodology of fixing people. And instead of giving them Jesus who will redeem them, we'll give them programs that will only disappoint them. You've got to give them Jesus. Number two, you've got to realize that rules don't change thinking. Rules just simply don't change thinking. You, you do realize that in church, we're all about rules, right? Boy, we got the commandments. We got all kinds of directives. We got all kinds of stuff. In our country, oh, we got battles right now, right? We got battles over marriage. We got battles over sexuality. We got battles over all kinds of sin. And we want to go to Congress and we'll make sure they make the right kind of rules because when you make rules, it changes people's way of thinking. Is that right? Wouldn't that be awesome? If I could just make a rule, I'm going to make a rule right now. I'm the pastor of this church. I have a right to make a rule. I'm going to make a rule. All of you are now happy. We don't allow unhappiness in here. We don't allow depression in here. And none of you, we don't allow sinners. So all of you are no longer sinners. Wouldn't that be awesome if I could just make a rule and that work that way? But what our problem is, is that we think somehow that our physical application of rules that work out in the physical arena somehow have any kind of an impact on our metaphysical mind. Let me tell you what rules do according to Scripture. Rules extend your sin further than it would have ever been without the rule. Don't walk on the grass. Wet paint. God. It extends it. That's what it says. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. He said this. The law was given that sin might become exceedingly sinful. And that's what happens. When you put a law down, you make... Let me ask you a question. If the speed limit is 60, how fast do you drive? Thank you for being honest in church. God bless all of you truth tellers. Okay, if they were to, since you drive 65, if they were to move that law to, say, 65, from 60 to 65, now how fast do you drive? So that's because you're a lawbreaker. All law does is extend the sin. Rules do not 
change a person's thinking. And yet we believe it does. That's where the church makes its mistake. We're going to have to grasp reality. You can't fix people. And rules don't change their thinking. Listen to the scriptures. Galatians chapter 3. Is the law then against God? The promises of God? Certainly not. But listen to this next statement. If there had been a law given, which could have given life, then truly righteousness would have been by the law. There's not one given that can give life. According to the scriptures, they call the commandments the tablets of death, the ministry of death. There's no law given that can give life. It wasn't supposed to give life. It was supposed to make you be aware that you're dead. It was supposed to make your sin more sinful so that you could actually see that the sin you were committing was actually sin so that you could throw yourself on the mercy and grace of Jesus and have it get taken away. That's what it was for. But the church has this belief system that if we make rules, I've had to, I've had someone come to me say, Pastor, uh, you need to have a rule about our young ladies in church. Some of their shorts are getting too short. If I tell them how long to make them, they'll make them shorter. And we can't really afford that. It can't, it can't be any shorter. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and it's, it's not the exterior that's going to make a difference. It's what's on the inside that's going to make a difference. Colossians chapter 2, the Bible says this. If you died... You know the, the Air Force constantly. They, they know what time it is. I love them, though. I appreciate it. They're watching over us. We should be grateful for that. It says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, listen to this. Why is though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch. Do not taste. Do not handle. Which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. They're not wisdom. They just have an appearance of wisdom. And listen how you get it. In self-imposed religion. Not something I'm putting on you, but self-imposed religion. False humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. When Paul wrote that, he was basically saying, like this is the first of the year, so some of you guys have decided you're going to lose weight and you're going to go on a diet and you're going to exercise. And, and it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm only going to eat three calories a day. That's all I'm going to eat. Hey, what happens when you say that? Man, when you go past Krispy Kreme donuts, how much more tasty does that donut seem? When you weren't even paying attention to Krispy Kreme, but now that you're on a diet, I've got to have one. I've got to have. My wife told me, this is it, first of the year. This is it. it. Drawing a line in the sand, I am doing it this time. That's it. So she calls me up last night. She went out with Holly Beckton for a birthday party. Happy birthday, Holly. They give me a call. Y'all want any Krispy Kreme donuts? No, I don't want any Krispy Kreme donuts. I'm trying to diet here. <laughs> they come home with a whole box full of those things. You want to know why? Because anytime we sin, we need somebody to sin with us to make us feel good about our sin. <laughs> That's exactly why right there. <laughs> Rules don't change thinking. Number three, redemption is power. Oh, my goodness. If we could get a hold of this, you can't change anybody. Rules don't change people's thinking, but redemption is where the power is. The Bible says that he became obedient even to the point of death, but even the death of the cross. The cross is where our redemption lies. Listen to what Paul wrote about the redemption that we get in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 22. It sets you out of the reach of hell. It says, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet, now he, Jesus, has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. That's the crucifixion of Jesus. Why? To present you. So let's get, who's, who's doing the presenting? Jesus is doing the presenting. Who is he presenting to? He is presenting to the Father. He says this. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So we've got Jesus doing a presentation. The Father being the recipient of that presentation. And he says when Jesus presents us on the basis of his death, burial, and resurrection. That he is going to present us before God. Holy. Set apart. Blameless. Having done nothing wrong. And above reproach. Out of the reach of who? Of God. 
God cannot judge me. God cannot charge me. God cannot kick me out because of what Jesus did. And if we have the ability, it'd be different. He says, in, you know, in the, in the face of the devil, you can't do this. But he, said, he didn't say in the face of the devil. He said, in the face of God, whenever I meet God, I'm not like, oh, my goodness, it's my turn to meet God. What am I going to do? I know there's some stuff that I've done after I'm saved. Oh, my goodness. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, you are out of the reach. He has made you holy and blameless and above reproach. He can't grab onto you and charge you because of what? Jesus did. There is power in that. You understand what he's saying right there? Basically, he's saying it's an MC Hammer song. Can't touch this. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I, I thought about, you know, the you start you, you, can't, you can't touch this. Because of what he has done, that's where the power is. When somebody walks in the door, if they're like, oh, pastor, you don't understand, I've sinned. Well, there, there, you know, there's a 95-day program that we have, and if you'll do all of these things, but if you miss even one day, bro, I mean one day, God's going to condemn you to hell. You really think that's what they need to hear? That's not what they need. What they need is Jesus. Because his redemption is where the true power is. Man, when I walked in the church, I wasn't even sure I liked the church. But I did like Jesus because of what he did for me. We got to grasp a hold of some reality. Secondly, we have to adjust our approach. You know, how do you, how do you really go out there and, and reach people? In verse 7, the Bible says this. Listen to the three things that Jesus did. Prior to ever leaving heaven, this is what he did in order to leave heaven. What did he do? He said here that he made himself of no reputation. That's one thing. He took on the form of a bondservant. That's two things. And he came in the likeness of men. That's three things. Jesus did those three things in order to come. And here's what I mean. He knew from the very beginning, if I'm going to go out and help these people, i got to realize that they're, they're irreparably broken and they don't need repair, they need redemption. I understand that. They don't need law. The law has been around for 1,500 years. It's done nothing but make them more sinful. So they don't need law. What they need is redemption, and redemption is where the power is. So I realize that I'm going to have to die for them. But dying for them won't do any good if they won't receive me. I could go die for the whole world, and the whole world won't ever receive me. I've got to somehow connect to them so that they understand that I'm doing it for them, and they can get it in a way that is approachable to them. That's what we're going to do. And our approach needs to be that way. Jesus sets the example for our approach. What does he do? Let me give you three things. Number one, our message must be in the power of the cross and not in the power of the crowd. I don't know if you have seen what, what has happened here, but let me tell you what's happened. The Bible says that Jesus made himself of no reputation, no reputation whatsoever. Now, now let me tell you what goes on. We have grown larger. And I'm not talking about Northside. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ has grown larger. And in the process of growing larger, you always know that the majority seems to have power, right? But what we have discovered in our day and age right now is that being in the majority doesn't necessarily make you in power. Because what's running our nation right now, the majority or the minority? The minority, but we still believe, even though we're living in a day that definitely shows us that majority doesn't rule, we believe because of our size that we're now going to leverage the power of the size of God's church and the influence of God's church across the world rather than the power of his cross. We believe if most of us think a certain way that it's all going to be all right rather than understanding that Jesus Christ, though he could have leveraged his power, he could have called 10,000 angels to break him free from that cross if he wanted to use the power of heaven. He could have done that. But he chose not to because his power was in the cross. The Apostle Paul said it this way. He says, I choose to know nothing among you people except Jesus Christ and him crucified. If I have to break it down to any one thing, it is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the wisdom of God. That is the power of God. And that should be our message. That's what it should be about. Before there were millions and billions of believers, there was a baby in a manger and a Christ on a cross. And there was a minority group of people that believed that. That believed it. 
We have to adjust our approach. Our service also has to be from desire and not obligation. He says there not only did he make himself from no reputation, but he took on the form of a bondservant. Now that's significant. The word bondservant is the word doulos. And it's very particular because it goes back to the Old Testament teaching of the, of the year of Jubilee. There were Sabbath years. That means every seven years. And when there was a Sabbath of Sabbath, 79 or 49 years, on the 50th year, it was known as the year of Jubilee. Over the course of 49 years, a person could get their life in pretty much in the shambles. You could get yourself in debt. You could lose your home. You could lose your family. You could lose your, your livestock. You could lose everything. And sometimes the, the, God allowed his people to bring his own people into servitude. So you could have Jews with Jewish servants. But on the year of Jubilee, you were required, no matter who you were and no matter what the debt was, you were required to release those people and release their debt to you and release uh, their livestock to you and release their families. So every 50 years, if you live that long, or at least once in a lifetime, you got to do over. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be nice to know it's like, well, I'm 49, all of my debts are canceled. <laughs> That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? And you got to be released. But here's the thing. There were certain servants that said, I, I don't want to go anywhere. I like working with you. I like being on your farm. I want to stay here. To which the owner would have to reply, I can't keep you here because if you stay here, I'll be breaking and violating the law of Jubilee. And I can't do that. So God made provision. He said, okay, if somebody really wants to stay, then I've got to give them some kind of a mark. And he said, take them, walk over to the doorpost of your house, take their earlobe, put it up against the wall, take an awl, knock a hole through it so you could pierce their ear, and then take an earring and stick it through there. When a person sees that earring, they'll understand that you're a bond servant, that you are serving because you want to, that yes, you've been freed, and yes, you could go, but you don't want to. You want to stay, and this little mark here says, I'm staying legally, and this person's doing nothing wrong. I just want to be here. I've been pastoring here for 19 years. Can I tell you what? When I study for a message, I never study out of obligation. Uh, you know, my only challenge is, is, is gosh, I, I don't have enough time to preach the messages that I want to preach. My greatest contention is with the music ministry. Not because of the music that we sing, but because like, y'all are in my way. <laughs> I need more time. I need more time. Like, well, good night. We only got three minutes as it is, pastor. So we battle back and forth for time because I so desire to do what I'm doing. I love to do what I'm doing. Do you want anybody serving you out of just obligation? Well, you know, I'm teaching Sunday school this morning, not because I love you guys, but I made a commitment and I'm a man of my word. What a tragedy to have somebody serve you that way. That's a tragedy. You ought to serve as God has you serving because you want to. Man, I love, I love it when I go to a restaurant and I run across a, a waiter or a waitress who just really likes being a waiter or a waitress. You know what I mean? Because they're really good at it. And then you can tell those that have to make a living, there's nothing wrong with them, but you can tell when they have to make a living and, and people are making requests and it's pretty hard on them. And they serve you pretty well and we tip no matter what. And we tip for bad service because I don't tip for service. I tip for Jesus. You know what the Bible says? Do all things unto the Lord. All things. What kind of tip are you going to give to Jesus? What if Jesus was your waiter? <laughs> How'd you tip him? Well, he wasn't a very good waiter today, Pastor. You need to understand. <laughs> right? So our service should be from desire, not obligation. Number three, our ministry must be incarnational. It must be. That means that he said, coming in the likeness of men. Coming in the likeness of men. When Jesus stepped out of heaven, he could have come down if he wanted to like he's coming the next time. You know, when he comes again in his second coming, he's not coming like he came the first time. He's coming quite different. But the first time that he came, he came in the likeness of men, which means it was incarnational. Here's the definition for incarnational. And I like this definition. It is, I step completely into your mess, no matter how messy it is. I offer myself at the expense of myself. I choose to be fully present in situations I want nothing to do with, all because this is what love looks like. Could you imagine if we had that kind of incarnational service? It's like, I'm stepping into your mess, and it's a mess. It's a mess. Well, you know, the church would never want me. Why not? Well, you know, I've, I've ruined my, my marriage. I've ruined my children. I, I've, I've, I find myself drinking. I've been a, a, a drug addict. Uh, Y'all would never want to mess with me. And Jesus said, no, 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 you don't understand something. I, I've come to get into your mess, no matter how messy it is. 
And I recognize that when I get into your mess, it messes with me. But I'm going to do it at my own expense. It's going to cost me. Come down here. It costs Jesus. Come down here. And what he was saying is that the way our ministry has to be, you can't minister from a distance. You got to get involved in people's lives. You have to. You have to get involved. And that's why we are trying to get you guys connected up to the Lord and trying to get you connected to one another because you can't minister from a distance. You got to get close to be able to do that. God says our ministry should be incarnational. Jesus Christ made sure that he knew, that you knew, that we had to engage in people's lives. And today, we don't be bothered so much, right? We don't want to be bothered with other people's lives. I mean, I got life to live. I got things to do. I got places to go. I got people to see. And so I don't have any time for somebody who's got a challenge. That's not giving them Jesus. Got to give them Jesus. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul put it this way. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would offer your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's incarnational. It's getting in there. Let me give you the right approach, the right attitude that we need to have. Here's what Paul wrote. And everything I'm giving you, I'm putting it on the board, is scriptural. So these aren't just my ideas. These are scriptural teachings. The greatest missionary statesman since Jesus Christ wrote these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, For though I am free from all men, I don't have a responsibility to you. I don't have a charge to you. I am free from all men. However, even though I am, and I don't have this responsibility, I have made myself, nobody did this to me, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became a Jew, that I might win the Jews. And to those who were under the law as under the law, that I might win those who were under the law. And to those who are without the law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under the law of toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means win some. Paul said, you know what? Guys, understand this, that whenever it comes to Jesus, Jesus wants to save everybody. He wants to reach everybody, and he's what everybody needs. But we have to learn to understand them not for them to understand us do you see that he didn't say hey you Jews you need to become like a Christian so you can understand me uh, to you people under the law you need to become like a Christian so you can understand me uh, to the barbarians, you need to become like me so you can understand. No, he didn't say that. He said, for those of us who know Christ, we're the ones that are mature enough to say, they don't really need to understand who I am. I need to understand who they are so that I can appropriately communicate to them the message of Christ. That's the kind of way that we should be approaching other people. That's why it doesn't really bother me what somebody else is doing anymore. I just need to understand what they are. So if there's a person who's been riddled with drugs... I know what that's like. I can say, hey, been there, done that. The person who has engaged in, in alcoholic beverages to the point of drunkenness, been there, done that. The only thing that I hadn't been there, done that was, was um, fortunately for me, is that Terry and I were sexually pure before each other. But other than that, and I don't know why that didn't happen, but other than that, I've, I've pretty much done everything I think that could be done known to mankind. And guess what? You would have never accepted me. But Jesus did. Amen. Jesus did. And he changed me. That's the good part. He changed me. Because he didn't want me to stay there. Number three, and I'll close. We'll have to face two of our greatest fears. Man, if you're really going to change, you've got to face a couple of fears. And there are some fears and some fears that you struggle with. Our two greatest fears are in the area of our feelings and our thoughts towards ourselves. The first one is rejection. See, rejection creates this feeling of insecurity, and insecurity would just mess you up. If you ever dealt with an insecure person, it's, it's hard to live with an insecure person. It's hard to be around an insecure person because they take everything personally. You could say the thing farthest away from having anything to do with them, and they just assume that that's what you're talking about. It's a very exhausting kind of life to live, to be around a person in security. But we fear, we really fear rejection. All of us want to belong. That's why walking in a church is such a challenge. Because, oh, I don't, I, I'm not like any of you people. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You just don't know us. Right? It's like getting married. You think, I've met the greatest man. No, you just don't know him yet. <laughs> Come back and tell me that in about five years. 
Well, I, I love him. Now, five years later, I love him. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do love him. <laughs> but had I known, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you, we're all the same. We're all the same. We're all sinners. But it creates this feeling of insecurity. What did the Bible say? He says, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That's a very wordy statement. Let me translate it for you. Here's what Jesus was saying. Here he is in heaven in his godness, in his spiritual realm. He's in heaven. And the Father is saying, I need someone to send down and redeem these people. And you got to understand there's a heavenly host that's in heaven that's not God. There's angels and beasts and a heavenly host that's in heaven. According to scripture, they still haven't quite figured out this thing called salvation. They haven't quite figured out redemption because they're not lost. So they don't know what it is to be lost and they don't know what it is to be redeemed. So there's a misunderstanding about it. It's like whenever you see a, a person who has a baby, a, a little toddler. You see a mom with a toddler, right? And they're sitting at the table, a really young toddler, and they're sitting at the table, and all of a sudden this, this toddler is a little sick, and, and he or she sneezes, and snot comes out of their nose. And you're like, whoa, I'm going this way. I'm leaving. What does the mama do? And you're like, good Lord. Do you eat with that hand? The mom just snatches off, wipes on the napkin. What? 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 <laughs> right? And you don't have any kids. You have kids, guess what? You're like, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It changes. See, then you can understand. My son, whenever he got married, before he got married, and we talked about women and how, how you handle a wife, he's like, not my wife. Do you understand? He's extremely humble now. Very humble. Very humble. So I, I understand now. I was wrong. I was wrong. I understand now. So there's that sense of the, the, the angels, they don't understand. So when Jesus is getting ready to step out of heaven, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is a very ungodlike thing you're getting ready to do. What was he getting ready to do? He was getting ready to take a swan dive into the cesspool of our sin. God's holy. He's, he's separate from sin. He's not a sinner. What he was getting ready to do was very uncharacteristic for God. And so the angels now, according to Scripture, they peer into our salvation. They're trying to figure out what in the world's going on. When they watch our worship services, they're trying to figure out why in the world would somebody sit down there and sing to God and lift their hands to God? Why are they doing that? And they're trying to figure it out because it's so uncharacteristic. And here's what the Bible says when he says it's not, even though he was in the form of God, he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. Jesus understood that what he was getting ready to do, that the heavenly host would not understand. And they might think differently of him as he did it. But he was God. He wasn't going to be less God when he went down there and did this. So it wasn't something, the way the word really translates is it wasn't something to be held on to something to be grasped for, something that you had to hold tightly to. That was not what his godness was like. In fact, what he understood was that if he didn't, if he wasn't comfortable with who he was, he couldn't come down here and redeem mankind, which is one of the great privileges of being God. So he wasn't concerned about his reputation in heaven. He was concerned about our lost condition and our eternity. And he did things that were uncharacteristic, at least in the span of, of eternity past. And the heavenly host, what they had previously seen, now he was going to go down and take on a body. And he was going to do something so completely uncharacteristic because he wasn't worried about his reputation. He was secure. He was secure. He wasn't worried about rejection from others. He was rejected and despised by men, Isaiah 53. He wasn't concerned about that. There's a movie that I saw many, many, many years ago. And I'm giving up my age. It was called Grease. Do y'all remember Grease? Uh, we had Danny Zuko and Sandra D. I remember in the opening of that movie, you got Danny and Sandra, and they're on the beach. And it's such a lovely uh, from here to eternity type scene. They're on the beach. The waves are crashing. They're all wearing pastels. And Danny is, Danny is just in, so in love with Sandra D. And it happens to be over the summertime vacation. They're still high school-aged kids. 
And so it fast forwards, and they're now at school. They're at Rydell High School. And as they go to Rydell High School, on the first day of school, here comes Danny with the T-Birds. He's got on a black jacket, got the T-Birds up here. He's leading the T-Birds. I mean, he is dressed to the nines, and he is the man on campus. Sandra D is the new girl, and she doesn't know anybody. And so she comes up to school, and she meets a few of these girls. But Danny doesn't know that Sandra D is at this school. And unfortunately, she meets Rizzo. And Rizzo is that girl. And so Rizzo realizes that the girl that Danny is talking about that he really enjoyed over the holiday, it happens to be Sandra D. And, and she is kind of jealous. So her goal is to hurt Danny. And what's the best way to hurt Danny but to mess up his reputation? So she sets him up and causes this meeting where Sandra D's behind her. And she's talking to Danny, and Danny's being all cool. And then she steps aside, and there's Sandra D. What does Danny do? He forgets that he's at Rydell High School. He forgets that he's around his buddies. He forgets who he is for a moment. He's like, Sandy, what are you doing here? Oh, my goodness. How did you get here? I thought you were gone. And she's like, oh, oh, Danny. You, you. And all of a sudden, his buddies are like, what in the world is going on here? And as soon as he sees his buddies, he's like, that's my name, baby. Don't wear it out. <laughs> and then the whole movie is set up for how they come back together. Why did Danny act that way? He had a reputation to protect. And since he had a reputation to protect, he couldn't even do what he really needed to do to have that relationship. It took a whole movie to get him back around. And guess what? Guess what? Sandra did. Sandra decided, well, he doesn't want the Sandra D, so I'm going to turn into like one of the T-Bird girls. And then he turned into the Sandra D guy. And then they finally decided in the end, let's be neither one. Let's just be us. And life was a whole lot better. Right? Isn't that right? Some of us struggle with reputation and rejection. When God began to give me insight for our future, and I learned some things. You know, in church, we're not allowed to learn anymore. You ever say something one time, and that's it. You can never say another word, and you're done. And if you ever change your mind, why well, you're going to hell, and you're an idiot. And so I've heard, my goodness, last year, I must have heard a thousand times, but pastor, you said, but pastor, you said, but pastor, you said. To which I said, yes, I did, and I was wrong. Yes, I did, and I was wrong. And what I learned was, don't say stupid things like that anymore. Say stuff like, at this moment, God's leading me this way. But, but here's the thing. I realized that whenever God led me in a different direction and really trying to get me to get back to Jesus, that not everybody agreed with that. And now I got a lot of, hate, a lot of haters around Wilmington. <laughs> and that's okay. It's not that they hate me. It's just that I, I changed some things that were uncharacteristic of what I've done in the past. But I'm doing it that I might win the more. And some don't understand. You know what I've decided? My past reputation is not worth holding on to for the cause of those who don't know him yet. It's not worth it. And if somebody doesn't like me for that, that's okay. That's okay. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. When we get to heaven, God will wipe it all away. It won't make any difference anyway. I mean, it really won't. So I'm okay with that. Rejection. Secondly is correction. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, notice he didn't force it because you can't force it. You can't make a law to change a person's mind. It's something that has to be willingly received. He says, hey, you guys got some conflict. You got some disunity in your life. You got some challenges and some struggles here. Let me tell you what would fix this. If you knew from the very beginning what was going to take, death, so quit trying to fix people. They just need to be redeemed. Get them to Jesus. If you understood what that means, they're, they're irreparable. They're completely broken. Laws won't change it, and redemption is power. If you could grab a hold of that, life would be like a lot different. If you understood, you might have to change your approach, that the power is in the cross. It's not in the crowd. It's not in the majority rules. It's not in any of that stuff. It is in the cross of Jesus Christ. If you understood that whenever you serve, what really makes a difference is not you telling people, you need to serve, you need to serve, but it's in people viewing a servant of God who deeply loves to serve God, who wants to serve the way you serve because they see the deep joy that you have in your life. 
He said, allow this. Allow this mind to be in you. Don't worry about your reputation. I'll take care of your They're going to hate you. They hated me first. They'll hate you. Don't, don't worry about that. Don't hang on to stuff. Let, let, let this happen. Let this mind be in you. In Proverbs, there's two Proverbs there that talks about the heart of man. And it says, just as water, in, 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 as in water the face reflects the face, so also does the heart reflect the man. The Proverbs writer says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so it's, it's all attached to our thinking. And Paul wrote Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of that mind. And when you renew that mind, then and only then can you prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said, let, let this happen. Let, let it flow through you. Let, let something change in your life. Let something be different. If this is going to be the best year of your life, if it's going to be the best year of your life, I'm telling you, we need to give Jesus. We need to receive Jesus. We need to come to some different understandings about our culture, our traditions, our religion, our church, and those kind of things, and make sure that we give people Jesus. It is so awesome to ride that. This morning, sometimes some of my best worship is at 7.15 on Sunday morning. Let me tell you why. Nobody's in here. Just the worship team, sound people, our media team. They're the only people. It's a completely empty sanctuary. And they'll start singing and playing those songs. And even they seem much more free to worship at 715 in an empty building than when we fill it up. Because in the empty building, the only people that are in here are the, the worship team who loves to worship, the media team who loves to make sure you can hear and feel and sense the worship, and the pastor who enjoys the worship. So when we worship, it's like, man, we're having a good time. I'm hopping around back there and... I'm having a great time. And when we come in, it's like, oh, oh, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a bit of a hindrance. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenge. But I'm telling you, let me tell you who they need. Jesus. That second song we sang today, Son, that's a home run out of the park. This is amazing grace. Oh, my goodness. And that's the power of God is Jesus Christ. When I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Let's make sure we do that. Stand with me. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for a new year, 2014. In this year, I'm begging you to send us sinful people. Send us people in need of grace, in need of a Savior. Send us people with messy lives. Send us people who need to see incarnational service. Send us people also, Father, that believe that this place being your church is a special place to be a desirable place to be. Send us people who want to serve, who aren't forced to or have to necessarily be recruited with hard, strong-arm tactics, but people who, out of a joy for Jesus, want to serve. Father, help us in all that we do to make sure that when someone comes in here that they never see our denomination, they never see uh, our structure or our methodologies, but they see Jesus. Because that's who we want to give. And Father, not only do we need to give him, we need to receive him today. For some of us, we have maybe felt like that you haven't been dealing with us the way that you have in the past. And I think that more likely, we just haven't been dealing with you. We've sort of stepped away even though we're in the congregation. I pray, Lord, to give them Jesus. And they would have a renewed relationship with you. And understand that you love them. That you have made them holy that you have made them blameless, that you have made them irreproachable in your sight through the death of Jesus on the cross. That is the power. If there's a person here today who has never trusted Christ as their Savior and they're lost and they've got so much junk in their life they don't know what to do with it and they don't think they could ever fix it, 
I hope you'll help them to understand that you don't plan on fixing it. You plan on forgetting it and redeeming them from it, from that stuff. Help them to be saved today and help those of us who are saved to embrace what Jesus did for us. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You come if you have need. We'll meet you down front.